Welcome to Interplay, Conversations in Music. This is your host, Michael Shapiro. And today, from Yale, from New Haven, I'm speaking to composer Martin Bresnik. Martin, thank you for joining us. A great pleasure, Michael. Now, Martin's Bresnik's compositions scan across every medium, you know, opera chamber music, symphonic music, film scores, computer music. His music's performed throughout the world, and for good reason, because Martin delights, he says, in reconciling, reconciling, I should say, uh, seemingly irreconcilable uh, structures and repetitive gestures derived from minimalism, perhaps, but I, 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 I use that as, as just a little bit of a statement. I'm not really sure what that means anymore. Martin, I'm curious about one thing. Isaac Bashevis Singer said in one of his writings that a writer is not established by his style, but the style of the writer, who the writer is, establishes the style. You must have given thought of, to this over the years. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, you put your finger on a very important feature of my thinking about composition, uh, that, and what, it is something that I recognized quite early, that I was very eager to explore all sides of my musical personality without inhibiting myself by choosing a style or becoming completely uh, uh, captured by a single way of working. Um, and, and as a result, I think if it can be said that I have a style, and I think in some sense it can be said that I have a style, it is only because of the, it, because of the way I work and the interior of the work that the style becomes manifest. It's not in the surface. The surface may vary very widely from composition to composition, but it's an approach and it's in the, in the way in which I go about thinking about the, the, the way the music unfolds, not the, not the surface of the music. I'm just curious about world music. Uh, do you find that your music is affected by areas that are outside of Connecticut? <laughs> I mean, frankly, if I was only affected by the music inside of Connecticut, it would be Michael Bolton and uh, Gene Tierney, A Town Without Pity, or something like that. <laughs> and it does stretch a little bit wider than that. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I'm a New Yorker, really. Uh, uh, I grew up in the city, uh, and I was exposed to a very wide uh, variety of music, and also in my family background. Uh, my my aunt was a professional singer, but both folk music and uh, Yiddish music, and also uh, uh, pop music and jazz. And I mean, it was every kind of thing. I had cousins who who were interested in the musical field. Uh, one one was a drummer with Vic Damone and and uh, Billy Eckstein, and the other was uh, in, involved with Langston Hughes, trying to get a a production on with Langston. So I've been exposed to a lot of music and I've always been quite interested in a lot of music from my own environment and from, from places much farther afield. Well, farther afield, I, I listened to Ishi's song. Is that the name of the piece recently? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right. talk about that, please. Well, Ishi's song is actually quite unusual in my, in my catalog uh, for any number of reasons. For one thing, uh, the commissioner uh, is, was an Italian colleague who was in a pianist who was very interested in North American indigenous music, uh, a kind of music in which I needed to acquaint myself with in a much greater way than I had up to the time he commissioned me. Um, and uh, when, I, when he suggested uh, that, I at first was kind of at a loss, but I remembered a really remarkable documentary about the about Ishii, who was a member of the Yahiyani people of Northern California near Mount Lassen. And the documentary, which I saw sometime in the early 20th century, or 21st century, it's from the late 90s when it was made, was very touching to me. And um, because, you know, Ishii, uh, well, I don't want to go into the whole story of Ishii. People should find out. It's actually a very complicated story, but I was able I was able to, since Ishii himself was in contact and lived with the members of the anthropology department at the University of California in the early 21st century when he, when he found, they found him and he found them, 
he sang a number of songs that he knew, or actually quite a few, which were recorded um, by the University of California Anthropology Department. And you could actually listen to Ishii singing them very much in the way the Edison uh, wax cylinders were uh, heard, were created in some ways by Bartok and Kodai. Uh, and there I was very touched by a little tiny fragment and, and used that fragment, uh, which was a part of his uh, repertoire of songs. And um, so I said it was unusual because I don't, I mean, it's not as though I don't quote other composers' work, but in this case, uh, I not only quote that tiny fragment that we, they had at the time of that song, but I, I was in consultation with Bruno Nettle, who was great, the great uh, ethnomusicologist who had done considerable research into Native American music. And I learned a lot about uh, that music and way, the way it's made, how, how it's constructed in terms of its pentatonic structure. And it's also periodic structure. And I tried to make a piece uh, for, for Emanuele Archiuli, who was the commissioner, which would represent Ishii's song within a context of musical construction that he, Ishii himself, even if he might not have recognized it in the way that I did, but did honor to the procedures by which that music was created in the first place. Yeah. But there's, yeah, yeah. there's not much of my music that actually does that in that way. But the, no, but every piece is unique, I think. But it yeah. certainly comes from you. I've been listening to a great deal of your music in preparation for today. And one thing I notice as a composer is the ability that you've got, which is infinitely strong, to take a fragment and then burst it apart as you go through a piece and use the structure of the fragment to create perhaps the largest structure of the piece, the micro and the macro operating simultaneously. It's very well put together. And I didn't hear one piece. I listened to several of the recordings, all of which are first rate, I might add, in which the stuff that you do, the basic in integral development of pieces, it's tight as a drum. You've got to think about that as you're writing. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, that has been, I think you've put your finger on by saying that a very characteristic feature of, of how I go about composing uh, and how my pieces are made. Um, I mean, if you look over my shoulder, there's the guy himself. Uh, quite a who's, guy. Who's, who's quite a guy, uh, <laughs> an admirable person and a magnificent composer. Um, Bartok's uh, Macrocosm and Microcosm is an organization that he worked a great, the architectonics of that uh, are are very persuasive to me. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to think that Bartok had actually very few followers who could be recognized. The ones who who imitated his style of folk music integration, you know, they they, they wasn't as persuasive because, you know, if you try to imitate the surface of a composer like Bartok, you end up being very much a, a very low low grade version of Bartok because <laughs> pretty hard to be a good, high grade version of Bartok. <laughs> but, if you but if you penetrate inside the music and you kind of come to grips with the thinking that gives rise to this and you try as best as you can to manifest some of that thinking in your own way, uh, you, you have the po potential of making something both personal and, and architecturally, objectively palpable and strong that, that other people who are listening intelligently can respond to. Well, every one of your pieces that I've heard has its own particular structure, and it's obviously being composed by somebody who's thinking of the large and the small simultaneously, without a doubt. Now, you studied with Gottfried von Einem, I saw that. And, I did. <laughs> which is an interesting thing. Did you do that in Europe? Yeah, I studied with him in Vienna. The story is briefly told that I, I uh, actually had a, a Fulbright and I was going over to study with uh, George Ligeti. Uh, but when I arrived on my Fulbright, Ligeti had accepted me as a student. Ligeti himself got a prize and grant and he left Vienna to go to live in Berlin for the year, which kind of crushed me. I was really distressed about that. And I ended up uh, 
starting with the, 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 the people who were in charge of my Fulbright decided to connect me with the craziest composer, as they put it, that they could <laughs> find in, in Vienna at the time. And that was Gottfried von, Ein, von Einem. Um, and um, it, it turns out that I did end up with studying with Ligeti for considerably, but that was a, a year or two later back at Stanford where I was a graduate student. But while that spent that year in Vienna, I was um, I was a student of Gottfried von Einem, probably the mo one of the most conservative composers in Europe of any reputation at that time, which would have been 1969-70. Let's let's talk about that period, if we might, because sure. I know I lived through it. I'm a little bit younger than you, but not by not by much. And we both lived through a time. I went to Columbia and Juilliard and and uh, Manus during that period, but I was studying privately, too. And uh, there was the great movement that if you didn't compose a certain way, you were verboten. There was a political structure which was, to me, incredibly ridiculous because it's, it felt authoritarian. So tell me about your experiences in the 60s learning music and being faced with, you know, you did want it. I don't know if when you figured out you wanted to teach and you're a great teacher and <laughs> your list of students is remarkable. That comes later. But what was your in, inner feeling towards that whole movement at the time that was limiting the way people wanted to express themselves? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I was very fortunate as a kid to attend the, the High School of Music and Art. And um, at the High School of Music and Art, I, I studied composition, you know, with, at, a, at a rudimentary level with a very talented teacher. And I also worked at a music camp in the summer. I was a waiter and an oboe player in the orchestra. I had this kind of dual role. And while I was there, I worked uh, in music with a Dutch guy, uh, Misha Namenworth, who, who was very strict in the kind of species counterpoint kind of style of thinking of things. So my earliest connection with this was very, you know, it was kind of supportive, but rigorous. And it, I didn't yet have any real grasp of, of what the world would look like, and especially the kind of world that you, you describe, which was quite fraught ideologically. It wasn't until um, uh, a, a bit later, because actually my earlier influences there, I just gravitated toward what I liked. And what I liked at that time was uh, Debussy and Prokofiev, a kind of an odd connection of people in modern music, well, for relatively modern music at that time. But once I got to, um, university. Uh, and actually, it's interesting because I studied privately during the first year of my university because I was at Hunter College at the time. And I studied um, for one year, I studied with William Seidman, who was at Manus, actually. Uh, he probably maybe not have been there any longer when you were there. I was here in 74. And he, yeah, this would have been when I studied with Bill Seidman must have been 64. So 10 years earlier. And Bill Sudden is a remarkable guy in his own way. And I, I, you'll, the pertinence of what I'm saying now will come evident in a moment because he just, uh, he said, hey, you know, there's a lot of music out there that you don't know that you should know whether you like it or not. And I'm going to give you lists of pieces to listen to and then we can talk about them and how you feel about them. But you should get to know these pieces. And his list was very uh, you know, Catholic. He he sent me to Stravinsky and Bartok and Schoenberg and Webern and Berg, Carter, who at, at that time uh, in, the, in that area of the 60s, he actually lived across the street from Manus, which was then on the east side, interestingly enough. I remember. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I, I got exposed to a whole lot of music. Uh, and I, at that time, you know, I was very young because I, I entered high school at a very young age. I graduated high school at 16. So I was studying with Bill Seidman, just turning 17. And it, it wasn't until I got to uh, the University of Hartford and the Hart School of Music that the issues that you described were becoming, in my world, very, very prominent. Uh, my teacher, my the teacher I ended up with there was a uh, very talented uh, Italian uh, guy, Arnold Franchetti, and he Bill Seidman actually had been a student of his and he said, well, you know, take what you can get from him. He was kind of philosophical. He didn't, he didn't really warn me sufficiently because Franchetti was in, in his own way, a, a kind of a, a, a fairly tyrannical character, but not in the sense of, you know, you had to write 12 tone music or not. He was kind of anti 12 tone music, but he wasn't exactly pro diatonic music either. So in some sense, 
I escaped, I wiggled through that period, um, experimenting a little bit with dodecaphonic music, not quite strictly 12 tone music, but that was the spirit of the times. I got to know my Webern and well, we all know, did. analysis. Yeah. But, but there was one thing that affected me. I mean, I, I always thought in that period was I am, you know, a Vietnam era kid. I'm not living in expressionist Weimar Republic or pre during, you know, just late Mahler times which I understand what they were doing. I understand the power of Webern's pieces or the Berg extravagance or the Schoenberg violin concerto. You know, I understand in the context. But in the context of Vietnam <laughs> and pop music and jazz and all the things you talk about, I never understood where it was coming from. It didn't seem endemic. It seemed like well, an epidemic, <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, for me, I mean, so... Uh, the turning point really is the the escape to California. I graduated from the uh, uh, University of Hartford in 67. I've been very active politically. I wrote for the paper. I put on plays. We went on demonstrations. Uh, it was a very exciting time. But when I got to California, I, I, I it was the summer of love in 1967. That's when I arrived, actually. And I was, uh, you know, I, I, I quickly... Uh, gave up my folk guitar, got myself a solid body Mustang Fender guitar and joined a rock band and I played kind of more psychedelic rock and I supported the, de we, my band used to go out and support the anti-war demonstrations when they occupied a building, they'd call us and we'd go out and play. So by nighttime, I was a kind of wild rocker. By day, I was a regular, you know, serious graduate student in music at Stanford and I came under the influence of uh, a person I, who's, who's, whose mind and heart left an indelible impression on me is, is John Chowning, who is really the, in some ways, one of the most significant uh, fathers of computer music in the world. And his kind of ideologically free, open, acoustically based, sonically based approach to music was incredibly liberating and allowed me in a sense to maneuver between the the stringent demands of uh, total serialism which i mean I, I i was tempted by that i can't deny it I, I have the kind of mind that is intrigued by those kind of puzzle puzzles but chowning's insistence on you know how do you how is a sound made what is a sound made of in its in its kind of acoustical concreteness you know that was really uh, very decisive and if I can add, it was Chowning who, in, who showed me the first score I ever saw of Ligeti's Atmospheres, and I kind of was knocked out. Uh, I, I saw that Ligeti was in some sense doing with this orchestra in a very humanistic way what we were trying to do with the computer by these you know, fantastical subdivisions of instruments to make a very complex sound, and decided at that point that I had to study with Ligeti one way or another. And that opens the door to a whole other kind of discussion because Ligeti himself uh, was extremely ambivalent about his relationship with the Darmstadt giants. He, 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 he did not accept them unequivocally and um, a good deal of the rest of his compositional life from the time I knew him, which dates back to 6970, 71, 72, is, was a negotiation uh, uh, with those ideas, some kind of dialectical negotiation with those ideas of, of dodecaphonic Martin, music. Martin Bresnik, it had to be for him a major conflict because he was a survivor from Hungary, wasn't he not? Oh yeah, he was. Uh, 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 he, but I mean, he, uh, you know, he's a, he. If a person could be said to be a complex person, he he is that complex person squared. You know, I mean, he or cubed or whatever, whatever uh, uh, exponent, yeah. exponential part you want to add to that. No, I know, I understand. He, you know, he, he, when he was in, I mean, I, I, this, this, we devote the entire rest of this thing to my understanding of I his want to talk about you more than Well, I mean, I, I can understand that. I mean, I have a lot of stories to tell about it, but I should only say, he said that uh, he wanted to write a kind of music by the time I, you know, was really closer with him, that was, as he said in German, weder modern noch postmodern, which really translates to means he didn't want it. He said it should be neither modern nor postmodern. He didn't want either of those. And he felt that the, the concept of the avant-garde was, and the concept, that concept was a kind of a trap, which would inhibit his 
development. And uh, this was a big crisis for him, which came to a head in his opera, Le Grand Macabre from the late 70s. And I think he resolves the conflict to his satisfaction. And I, to, my, to write some of the most wonderful music, I think of that, that era, but not always to the, uh, to the pleasure of those, uh, those uh, high modernists that he, in a sense, tweaks their noses by writing the kind of music that has auto horns and yeah, I know. You know, all these kinds of things in it. I'm not knocking any style. I don't care. It's just a matter of communication, love and peace and tranquility, if we may use late 60s terms. It's really putting it across, and especially now coming out of this whole business. Uh, you know, the, uh, the direct connection with the audience is very important. We do care what, what, how they listen and what they hear. We well, do. It, if I may, if you let me go off on a little stream here. The, go the, on the stream. Okay. The, the, you know, this guy, it was very influential to me. Uh, um, and he's, he's a great architect and a very impassioned composer. Wonderful. Yes, uh, wonderful no resistance, want no resistance to his music. And as it as it, his tradition comes to me through Ligeti in some ways, yes. I acknowledge that. But there's another composer who became more and more important to me, and is and and maybe even more important to me because of the way he works or worked. Uh, and that is uh, the great uh, Czech Moravian composer Leos Janáček. I'm with you. And in that <laughs> in in Janáček, you find that whatever architecture there is, is always in the service and completely in the service of some dynamic, almost theatrical circumstance. Because Gianacek is really an opera composer. That's right. And as a result, he knows that you can't sacrifice that moment for some ul ulterior architectural resolution. He would not be delayed by such a, 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 an imposition. It would not be put away from put put off from getting the dramatic circumstance that he wanted to illustrate. Yeah, and um, you know, I I began to feel more and more that you know, as smart as architectural music, abstract music is, sometimes it it doesn't take cognizance of the way musical time flows on its own meter and way of expressing itself. Yeah. Arch the architecture sort of demands a perfect symmetry or some other, some other thing, which I take as being coming more and more from the visual realm than the actual temporal realm. And so, you know, Al Augenmusik. Well, Augenmusik would be the most severe judgment. You yes, make. absolutely. Um, correct. <laughs> but I, I think even in a benign way, right? Um, you know, if you if you say that that you're constructing like a bridge structure which in which the beginning and the end are the same you or even the reverse or some inversion of the same uh, you you are imposing in some way something which ha which makes more sense visually mm -hmm. than orally since we really don't hear uh, retrogrades particularly well and um, <laughs> how how we hear well yeah. how we hear is yeah. really I mean, some of the Janacek seem to have his finger on. It, it, that's why that music is so, uh, it's, it, it, once that you get the point of what he's trying to do, he's almost Mozartian to speak of the gentleman behind you there on your wall that's in his ability to, to, to create a, a, a circumstance in a musical environment, which is just unbelievably vivid and alive. So no, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, no, it's beautifully said. I listened to Sinfonietta of Janacek yesterday, actually. Yeah. And, oh well, there's, a, you know, it's a remarkable, or, I mean, it, it's a remarkable in every direction. And I teach that work to my students, actually, particularly. We're going to talk about teaching, and we have to leave in a very short period of time. But I okay. want to speak to you about uh, two things for uh, uh, about your pieces and then about yes. teaching. Okay. First, I noticed in looking at your, as Mel Brooks would say, your oeuvre, that yeah. as an auteur, yeah, that a lot of your pieces aren't trio or string quartet, although you have some, but they have titles. Yes. So you know, is it first the words, then the music, prima le parole, or uh, how how are you thinking? How does that happen? Well, uh, you know, I I mean, this is a whole other area of my my personal life, which is so important to me, is my love of literature and theater, and. Um, I've always felt that uh, literature has inspired me uh, 
I mean, from the, going from the very, very first works of mine, they often take a point of departure from some literary work or a poem. Um, and I've always, I've, I felt that that is a stimulus to think musically. So it's not as though I, I'm a great, I have a huge uh, collection of songs. It's not, that's not sort of my, what I've done. Although, I, I mean, I've written a, a considerable amount of vocal music, but that's not, Schubert I'm not. I mean, with that incredible gift that, that he had. But uh, I, I do think a poem like Melville's poem, Pantusic, uh, makes me think musically. Uh, you know, Heinrich Heine's uh, great poem, Wir Weben, Wir Weben, gives me, which means we're weaving, we're weaving, is a stimulus for That's me. That's an instrumental that. piece, as I remember, yes? Yeah, both of those pieces. Pontusik is a piece for orchestra for, I wrote for the ACO. Wir Weben is a string orchestra piece in three movements. Um, so even works that have no, that, that are abstract works in music may be, stimulated by something I'm thinking about, about uh, a poem or a piece of literature. Now let's talk about preservation, something I think about at almost 70. Many, you have many quotes, albums, as we used to say in the industry. Yeah, used to um, be, yeah. It, Don't you believe, and I do believe very strongly, as much as live recording, live performances are wonderful, recorded performances is really where it's at in as far as distribution is concerned, especially during a time like today, like what we're going through to these days. You must have given thought to the preservation of your work, not only in the printed form with the various publishers you've worked with, but also recordings. Uh, don't, yeah, well, yeah. indeed. I mean, uh, I, in my earliest, and, and that's also connected with my uh, very close connection with the performers who, who made those recordings. Uh, whose 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 artistry contributes so much to whatever I've been trying to do as a composer, uh, yeah. I mean, and in fact, uh, Michael, I'm, we, we, I have another CD coming out very shortly, which will include the Brentano String Quartet performing a relatively, well, quite new work for String Quartet based on the poetry of Wallace Stevens. So there you go for that, and uh, a piece uh, for multiple cellos as performed by the great. Uh, young cellist Ashley Bathgate, and she kind of, by overdubbing, we have a little cello orchestra, but that's a, a piece Marvelous. of honor my, my colleague, Aldo Pariso. And then a violin and a piano duo for my life, my wife, my life, my wonderful pianist wife, Lisa Moore, and my friend Ellie Toyota playing violin. Beautiful. And, you know, so these musicians who, who I value so highly, they, they help memorialize the music in their version of it yeah, yeah, in a very yeah. special kind of way. I've had similar experiences. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's great. Yeah. Last, yeah. last little this bit of discussion. You've been a teacher for quite a long time. Yeah, very long. In various schools, but at Yale for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and I know that the Bang on the Cairns All-Stars were all your students. Yep. And you've recorded on their, their cantaloupe music. Mm -hmm. um, now, you studied species counterpoint early on. I did. But what were, what was your precise learning? How did you learn? And then how do you now teach? I mean, are all your students put through the kind of species counterpoint that I was oh, no, put no. through? No, no, not at all. Well, first of Curious. all, I teach I teach now at the graduate level, right. and these people come to me completely developed in many ways. And the, the trick is to try to figure out what they want to do, help them to achieve what they want to do but also help them to understand that the horizon of what they want to do may be rather narrow and to open up that horizon so that there's still much to learn. I mean, if, if I can't- but Martin, be before they come, before they come, pardon me for interrupting, this is yeah. so important to me. I, I teach privately, I've never taught in university, but although I do residencies, I know that a fundamental background in creating the cabinet as a, a carpenter is so important so for me, I mean, I went through French training, Boulanger style training, and ear training with Madame Angie and all the very rigorous conservatoire type of stuff. And I find that if I get into a hole over the many years, as we all get into holes, what, where I've come from technically helps me reach my way out. And I heard it in your music. There's no question you've got fundamental abilities. So when those students come to you fully formed, are you thinking, well, have they done X, Y, and Z? And what is X, Y, and Z? 
Well, I, you know, I love so many different kinds of music and so many different kinds of music have things to teach that they don't know. Right. So it's, I don't, I don't, and particularly because the variety of things that are happening in music now are so, the variety is so wide that to push people into, you know, the kinds of things that I had to learn young, when I was younger, may not really serve them very well. So I try to find the, the, the example, the historical example or the actively still working example of the thing they are doing or attempting to do that would be a most inspiring to them and get them, get them going again. Now That's I teach what a, a great teacher that, does. Well, I, try, I mean, I, I, I had good teachers and I had terrible teachers. And <laughs> in a sense, I tried to learn from both of them, you know, from the, from the good teachers what was good and from the terrible teachers what to avoid. Um, and, um, and I do teach a course now uh, at Yale, which I've done for a couple of years, called Analysis of Western Music from the Composer's Perspective, which Good. treats a whole range of music historically from the perspective of the composer, not from the perspective of a theorist, not from the perspective of a person doing uh, uh, musicology, for example. Excellent. So if I'm teaching a piece by Perotin, or if I'm teaching a piece by... Josquin, or if I'm teaching a piece by Bach or Schumann, I'm looking at it as I as much as possible from its interior as I understand. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I and some of that, and I tell my students, you know, I I, I annoy my students by by uh, quoting Thoreau very often. You know, Thoreau very famously said that um, the uh, enterprises of one generation are abandoned by another, like so many stranded vessels. And I often am struck by how young students ride right past some of the difficulties that you and I experiences or the, or the, or the contretemps or the, the, the controversies that were so important to us, they don't, they don't care at all about anymore. No. So the question is, do, what in the older music is still living or valuable before those, those vessels sink in the harbor? I say to them, let's go, let's go aboard and see what treasures we can still find and take with us before they sink forever. Martin Bresnik, composer extraordinaire, wonderful professor at Yale. Uh, this has been extraordinary. It's been too short. But I, I think all of our audience needs to get on the vessel with you and your beautiful music, which is so varied, and it's a world unto itself that you've created over all these years. So, Martin Bresnik, thank you for being on Interplay. Thanks for having me. And there's your phone. As a phone. <laughs> so. All best. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, Michael.